let's turn to uh, two of his lessons, Faithful Amid Persecution. Now, it's very difficult to, and when you're being persecuted, uh, when you're being persecuted, it's very difficult sometimes to stay faithful. But I am so glad that when you look at the history, the church's history, all the martyrs, who regardless, of, they might, they were going to be burned at the stake. Uh, they were going to be, they were going to be killed, but yet they remain faithful. So the Bible, I'm reading the lesson on Tuesday's lesson, says throughout the early centuries of Christianity, the Christian church grew rapidly despite imprisonment, torture, and persecution. Faithful believers, faithful believe, believers totally committed to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaiming his word with power. Lives were changed, and tens of thousands were converted. And I asked to read several texts. It said, read Acts 2.41, Acts 4.4, 4, and uh, Acts 4, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 4, verses 4 and 31, Acts chapter 5 and verse 2, and Acts 8 through 11. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 8, 1 through 8. What do these verses teach us about the challenges the New Testament church faced and also why it grew <coughs> so rapidly? <coughs> I want to read a couple of these texts from the hymn. Uh, let's turn to Acts together. Let's turn to Acts 241. <coughs> Acts <coughs> chapter 4, verses 4 and 31. And let me read these texts from the hymn. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2, verses 41, 241, chapter 2 and verse 41. <coughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. And the Bible says, and they gladly received the word, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000. This verse 41 reads, so verse, I'm sorry, not 44. That was a 41, I'm sorry. And then Acts chapter 4, verse 4 says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them was about 5,000. And then verse 31 in chapter 4 reads, And them were together, all filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the word of God with boldness. So the question is asked: These verses teach about the right group rapidly. And the Bible says, and Saul was, uh, this is the persecution of the church, and Saul was commit, consenting unto death, and at that time, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his, bur to his burial and made great uh, lamentations over him, and as for Saul, who became Paul, he made havoc of the church, entering through every house, and hailing men and women, and committed them to prison. But chapter, and verse four, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere pre preaching the word. <clears throat> preaching the word, then Philip, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto them, uh, uh, heed unto these things, Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying, crying loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them, possessed with them, and many taken with sorceries that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. And what I said here, the church was persecuted, Stephen was stoned to death, and Saul, he made havoc of the church. Yet the church grew, and Philip preached in Samaria. All these, the church grew, 
in spite of what was going on in the church, the church still grew because one individual stayed together. I'm reading in the lesson, he says, disciples face threats, imprisonment, persecution, and death itself. Yet, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not their own power, in the power of the Holy Spirit, courageously proclaim the resurrected Christ and churches multiplied throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. I'm skipping down to the third paragraph. This instead faith filled the disciples' hearts. One glimpse of their resurrected Lord changed their lives. And my brothers and sisters, that's what Christ does for you and I. When we allow him to enter into our lives, he just changes each of us. He changes us if we are willing to be willing to be led by him. <laughs> our Lord had not only given them the, the, the great commission, but the great promise. I'm skipping down to the, to the very last paragraph. He said, the gospel penetrated the remotest corners of the earth. The gospel was preached, <coughs> and individuals believed. But it was preached, and individuals, yes, church was being pressed. You have to remember back in those days, the Christians, the church at that time, the lesson said, some, uh, <coughs> uh, they thought they were superstition. Superstition, because the church was new. This, this thing called Christianity was new. So it wasn't really what was popular, but yet the church grew. Now, that's different today. Uh, there's a church on every corner today. Amen? Every corner. But are everyone in there Christian? Are they really following Christ? Or are they just attending church? To be a Christian, but how do you live day by day? On Sunday on, on, and on Sabbath, we're dressed up. But how do you and I act during the week? How do we treat our brothers and sisters? How do we treat our family? Are we following Christ? It's, it ain't a uh, Tuesday. Let's ask the question what can we learn from the early church that could help us, the end time church? That's a good question. What can we learn from the early church that could help us, the end time church? One of the things that church, uh, the, uh, I think it's in very successful, but. <clears throat> And ain't that for legacy of love. They loved one another. They did everything. They had everything in common. Caring for the community. Wednesday's lesson. Caring for the community. See, the early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they did what, everyone? They lived the gospel. Believers modeled the ministry of Christ who went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Jesus, Jesus deeply cared for people, and so did the New Testament church. It was his unselfish love and commitment to meeting human needs combined with sharing the good news of the gospel and the Holy Spirit's power that made such an impact on the world, on the world in the early centuries of the Christian church. We asked the question on Wednesday's lesson, read Acts 2, 40, chapter, chapter 2, verses 44 to 47, Acts chapter 3, 6 through 9, and Acts 6, 1 through 7. We saw those circumstances vary. What principles can we learn from these passages about authentic Christianity? Uh, let me ask you a question. What is authentic Christianity? Can anyone answer that? What do you think Christianity is? What is being a Christian? Oh, I'm going to ask you another, another way. Uh, who are Christians today? Are there any Christians in the house today? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. talking about authentic uh, Christianity, it all has to do with living the Christian life. It, it's not just about, well, though it's important, it's not just about coming to church, which is very important, I'm not negating that, but it's also, or maybe, or maybe more important, when we are living out the life that we are claiming to be part of. So the Christian in the early in the early church 
what really uh, stood out um, for me is that they were, for example, in Acts chapter 2, they said they were, um, those now all who believe were together and, uh, and had all things in common and sold their possessions. So we get it into practical life, the practical Christian life. They were, they were selling their possessions and goods. They sold their possessions and goods, divided them among, among all as anyone had need. And so continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So now it's, if we are to ask ourselves, how do we live the Christian life? This is our model, I think. So I don't know how much we can do just like they used to do. I'm not saying everybody can sell their homes and then give the money to the church. But when we see somebody in need, what do we do? Do we say just, we're going to pray for you, brother or sister, but I have the money. I'm not going to share it with you. Or I can share it with you. So this is the real Christian life right there. We can read more of it, but it's really important. Can I, can I piggyback real quick? I think in addition to what you said, it has to do with relationship. I see everything in relationship. If I have a relationship with someone who helps me understand that when they're in need I and I have something, then I'm going to be willing to give it. So if I have a relationship with God and that relationship shows me that whenever I'm in need, there's like an abundance that he's willing to give me. So my relationship with God helps me to see the need for somebody else. So I'm willing to share, which gives me that heart to be like, I'll give up everything so that you can have. Without that relationship, we're not doing that. Thank you, Ricky. No, to, to, be a, to be a Christian is doing the right thing. All of us are put in circumstances sometimes where we have to do uh, the right thing. And that's what God wants us. He wants us to be obedient to his word. He wants us to love our neighbor. He wants us to treat our family correctly. Uh, just do the right thing and ask God to lead and to guide us. Uh, we only have a couple of seconds left. I'm going to read this paragraph in, on Wednesday's lesson. It said, in the great controversy raging in the universe, the devil wants to replace the image of God in humanity. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God in humanity. This restoration includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. Thank you so much for your comments today. Shall we, shall we pray? <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for this week's lesson. Help us, God, to be authentic in our Christianity. Help us, God, to do the right thing at the right time. And, God, we pray that you continue to bless our services today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We are high hina happy and peacock proud to have voices of triumph with us today. Let's give them a hand clap of praise in this place. We are excited to have you here with us. I used to be a recruiter myself back in the day at Oakwood College. That was Oakwood College then. I went to school with Flintstones, but we are happy to have you all here with us today. Let's sit back and enjoy what God has brought to us today, Central. Let's give them another hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord, everybody. I said, praise the Lord, everybody. Can we put our hands together for Jesus? I said, can we put our hands together for Jesus? Happy Sabbath, church family. This song just says, Lord, you are good. Turn to your neighbor and say, Lord, you are good. Let's go back. Come on. Put your hands together, church. Come on, praise and repeat after me. Say, oh. Oh, 
but we also know that he's an able God. How many of us believe that he is able to do exceedingly? <laughs> oh, y'all quiet with me this morning, church. I said God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask or think. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, exceedingly abundantly above all thank you Jesus all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in you you God is able to do just what he said he will do. Do I have a witness, church? He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Oh, don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He's able. He's an able God, church. I said he's an able God. Yeah, he's able. Let's sing it out like we know it. Come on, family. Say, God is able. God is able to just do what he said. Just what he said he will do. And he's gonna fulfill. He's gonna fulfill every promise. Every promise. That's what it says. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Because he, he won't. Lift up your voice, church. He's able. He's able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God is able. He's able. He's able. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to try that one more time. God is able. God just 
what he said. And he's gonna fulfill every promise. This is the best part right here. So don't give up on God. Cause he won't. Say he's able. Yeah. Y'all quiet church, but God never failed me. He's able. Oh. Talk about how he's able. Say, oh, 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 he's able. Sing it out, say, oh, 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 he's able. church. Don't give up on God cause he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God cause he won't. That's good. Don't give up on God cause he won't church. Who just sing that out with no music? Just sing it out like you mean it. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't. He's never lost a battle, church. One more time. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't. All together, church. He's able. Put your hands together for Jesus. Is he able? I said, is he able? Will you please rise for our call to worship? And our call to worship will be coming from the division of Psalms, or should I say the 122nd division of the Psalms. It's only the first, chapter, first verse. And it reads, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we say thank you so much for waking us up to see another beautiful, sunny Sabbath morning. Thank you for keeping us throughout the week. Now, as we welcome your presence in, let every word that is uttered, every bar that is sang, give glory to your high name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
everyone. Oh, no, let's try that again. Happy Sabbath, church. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? If God brought you through the week, go ahead and give him a round of applause. If he brought you through some trials and tri tribulations that you didn't think you'd overcome, go ahead and lift up to his name. If you are here this morning, go ahead and praise him. We are so glad that God brought you through and allowed you to be here this Sabbath morning because there's truly no place like home. <laughs> Psalms 34 verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 reads, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come on, church, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. If we seek him together, he will hear us and delivered me. From all my fears. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers him. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see that my God is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? We have a very special service plan because we have some special guests worshiping with us. And they're not just worshiping, but they're leading us out in worship. VOT and Dr. Pollard, we are so glad that you were able to come this morning and worship with us. And we hope that you feel right at home here at Central. Now, for anyone who's been close to me these past few days, you've known just how excited I've been for VOT to show up because they are my favorite choir. Ever, okay? I got the pleasure of hearing them when I went to OU Live, and the moment Ohimai stepped up and he said, all right, all right, all right, all right, I was hooked. I was like, it's over. It's over. Best choir right there. And I got the pleasure of hearing y'all again at Cincinnati, so I'm so glad you've come to my home to sing for us. And hopefully, when I come in fall, I can join y'all, but hey, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So once again, may you all feel right at home at Central, and may you enjoy this service. We're really glad that we are all here together, whether you're in the room or watching online, we're glad that you decided to join us here at Central, though it is better to be in the room. So we hope that you could come down to 972 Beachwood Road and join us for this morning's worship. So as they sing the welcome song, we encourage you to get up, go ahead and welcome your neighbor because you probably haven't seen these faces since last week. So get up and say hi to the person next to you. Welcome to Central. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. One more time, church family. Let's stand to our feet. Let's greet people around us. It's a blessed day to be in the house of God. This song, just, I just want to praise you. I just want to praise, wanna praise you forever, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, for all, for all you've done, you've done for me, for me. Say blessings and glory, blessings and glory, and honor, and honor, they are, they are. Shout out one more time. Come on, family. I just want to praise. I just want to praise you forever. Forever. And ever. And ever. For all. Blessings and glory, blessings and glory, and honor, and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, bless me. Let's take it up. I just, just want to praise you forever. forever. Oh, y'all sound good, church. And ever, and ever for all, for all, for all you've done. You've done. Thank you, Jesus. For me. Say, bless.
blessings and glory. Blessings and glory. And honor. And honor. They all. They all belong to you. Blessings and glory. Blessings and glory. And honor. And honor. They all. They all belong to you. Blessings and glory. Blessings and glory. And honor. Blessing me, church. Praise Jesus in this place. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. For blessing me on your holy day. This song just says, He's an amazing God. And I think sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in our trials, it's so easy to get caught up in our stresses that we forget how amazing our God is. He's an amazing God, church. I said, he's an amazing God, Central. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise this morning, church. Let's give God praise this morning, church. God, we thank you. Oh, It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your love for me. Your love for me. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your sacrifice. Your sacrifice for me. And for every blessing. For every blessing. Give unto me. Give unto me. And for every valley, for every valley, you used to strengthen me. I don't deserve, I don't deserve your, love, your tender mercy. And if not for your grace, I be. That's a good place to worship. Oh. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your love for me. Your love for me. And it's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your sacrifice, Your sacrifice for me. For me. And for every blessing. For every blessing. Give unto me. Give unto me. And for every valley. You used, to, you used to strengthen me. I don't deserve, I don't deserve your, your tender mercy. Tender mercy. Not for your grace. Lift up your praise. I stand the maze. And I stand, I stand amazed, Jesus, I stand amazed, so amazing, amazed, say I stand amazed, I stand amazed, oh, I stand amazed, so amazed, so amazed. I stand, I stand amazed at your glory. Yeah, and I stand, I stand amazed. Oh God, I stand amazed. I stand amazed at your power. So amazed. So amazed. Amazing. God, and I stand amazed. Oh, and I stand amazed. Say, and I stand amazed. So amazing, so amazing, let your voice say so, so amazing, has it been amazing church, let your voice say so, so amazing, that's good, let's just stay right there, amazing. say so, so You, Jesus, say so. so amazing, amazing. Lift it up, 
say so. You're amazing, Jesus.
If we look to 1 Timothy 2, 1, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. You know, when I stand up here during prayer time, I think of the awesome God that we serve. I think of his protection over our lives day in and day out. I thank God for the safe traveling mercies that he's been given our guest today. So let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we are so very grateful. Lord, we just ask for forgiveness of sin for anything, Father God, that would come between you and us. Heavenly Father, we want to pray a special prayer, Father God, for the Oakwood University young people that are here within our midst today, Father God. You have granted them traveling mercies, Father God, and for that we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you, Father God, for Dr. Pollard, who will bring the word of God today, Father God. We just ask that you would bless him and use him in a mighty way. And Lord, we wouldn't be central if we did not take care of those that are with us and our own. So Lord, we have a special prayer for our sick and shut-in today. Lord, we want to pray for Sister Kathy Taylor, Sister Kathy Simpson, Brother Michael Favors, Phoebe Pullen, and Heavenly Father, we know that within our midst as we stand here or sit here today that they, we have people that are hurting inside father god they have gone through hurts that are so deep that only you father god can mend their broken hearts heavenly father we want to pray for our local and our federal and our state leaders father god we live in a time lord that there is so much craziness going on in this world, Father God, that it's only by your might and your protection that we are able to stand. Lord, we want to pray for Sister Valerie Jones, Father God, who's going to go into the baptismal pool today, who has made that decision, Father God, and for that we give you all the praise. Lord, we count it a blessing to be in this neighborhood and how you have blessed us. Lord, we pray for this community as we evangelize them, Father God. We pray for the upcoming meetings, Father God. But Lord, we ask that you would use each and every one of us as your disciples, Father God, that we might further the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, here we just lift our hands. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor, because truly you are worthy to be praised. You may be seated. Amen. Be seated in victory. Be seated knowing that God answers your prayers before we even say. It. So we'll sing hallelujah until you come Thank you, Jesus. And we'll dance in your presence.
morning again, Central. It's time where we can all participate this morning. We're going to do something a little differently today, so if I can have my ushers or deacon and deaconesses, we're taking up two offerings today. The first is going to be your tithe and offering, and the second offering is going to be for Oakwood University. So as you're going in your pockets, as you're going in your purses, dig deep. When we look at 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8, and this is the NIV version, it says, Remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart and not be under anything that's going to pressure you, not reluctant under any compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And this is the part I really like. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, uh, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Central, I'm just going to cut it short. We're going to have the choir come up as we take up this morning's offering. So after we do the second offering, then I will have prayer over the offering. But you know, Central, as we stand here today, we... In this church building, it's a testament of God's glory and his goodness to us. And so if you stick by at the end of the service, I'm going to tell you about all the good things that we've been able to accomplish here. So once again, after the second offering is collected, I will do prayer. Thank you. As you guys have heard, we are VOT, we are Voices of Triumph, and we are simply a family who loves to praise the name of Jesus. Is that all right? This song just says, to you, God, I give you, <laughs> I give you my trust. It says, for the ways, <laughs> the quiet family, <laughs> for the ways, your ways are loving, <laughs> your ways, God, are pure. How many of us want to walk in the Lord's ways this morning? Amen. Hallelujah.
thank you for this offering and tithes that were collected this morning, Father God. And we just ask that it would be used to the furtherance of thy cause. Lord, we bless and ask that you would just expand on the amount that was collected for Oakwood University, Father God, that it too might be used to your honor and glory. We thank you. We thank you for God's people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It's time for our baptism this morning, and I'm going to ask our baptismal candidate, Ms. Valerie Jones, to please step up here with me, and we're going to read to her the vows, and Central, you know what we do here. We want to embrace our sister. So Valerie, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and you do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with him? Amen. Do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Amen. Do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, tithes and offering, and life of service. Amen. And will you share the love and the forgiveness that God has shown you to others? Amen. At this time, we're going to have our baptism. And uh, just so that everybody can see, is it possible that the, the choir can kind of split? <laughs> and I'm going to ask uh, the deaconesses to take care of Miss Valerie. What we learned from our last baptism we have got a team that supports our new candidates. And if you look right over here, every single time somebody goes into the pool, we know that the angels in heaven are rejoicing, but we're rejoicing right here too. So, amen. So at this time, we're gonna have her go to follow me. So with the family and friends of uh, Valerie, come on up, come on, mom. If I had an opportunity to preach a sermon about this, it would be entitled, From a Bad Day at Walmart to the Baptismal Pool. This young lady met our evangelist at a Walmart. He said, you having a bad day? She said, yes. He gave her Bible studies. And two months later, this is what you see.
baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this morning. Seeking higher level fiscal and administrative enrichment, Dr. Leslie Nelson Pollard earned a Master of Business Administration from the, from the La Sierra University of Business in Organizational Management in 2005. To culminate his academic pursuits, he earned from Andrews University the Doctor of Philosophy degree in New Testament language and literature in 2007 with a specialty in apocalyptic literature. Dr. Pollard is the first African American to earn a PhD in academic content theology from Andrews University Theological Seminary. I think that deserves a round of applause. He is the first African American to earn that PhD. Since 1978, Dr. Pollard's leadership has reflected local, national, and international service. He has served as senior pastor for a number of large church complexes, including the Kansas Avenue in Riverside, California, Berrien, Los Angeles, California, and the Oakwood University Seventh-day Adventist churches. Additionally, he has been a youth pastor, a university chaplain, a healthcare program administrator, and an educational administrator. As a clergyman, Dr. Pollard has functioned as an evangelist, professor, ministerial educator, and leadership development facilitator to 17 million member general conference of the Seventh-day Adventist. For example, he conducts leadership and mission conferences regularly for SDA and non-SDA audiences. Dr. Pollard has spoken or presented in 44 countries. The environments are as diverse as Argentina, Australia, Brazil, China, England, Germany, Ghana, Guyana, India, Jamaica, Israel, Nigeria, Norway, Russia, South Africa, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Trinidad, Turkey, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Since 1979, Dr. Pollard has been married to the former Prudence LeBeach, who is here this morning. The Pollards have two daughters who are also Oakwood graduates. Dr. Pollard's personal statement says, my vision for living is found in Micah 6, verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require, require of thee? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. This calling centers me in my spiritual walk. I am a minister because God called me at the age of 16 to share his message as my life's vocation. I am a leader because the unique skill sets that God has gifted to me have carried me into positions of leadership across my career. I am an academic because I believe that education 
is on the same continuum as personal redemption. And I believe that expansion of the intellect is as great an, is as great an act of stewardship as is the care of my body. I am a teacher scholar because of my thirst for knowledge and my passion for engagement with other learners. I am an administrator because strategic visioning and tactical decision making is a foundational ministry that advances the mission of the institutions in which I have served. Therefore, I am a steward who accepts the vocation of a Christian service and leadership with deep humility and consecrated commitment. Following the special music, the next voice you will hear will be Dr. Leslie Nelson Pollard. Hear ye him. I said when our faith falters, when our devotion decreases, can we put our hands together that his mercy endures forever? Oh, come on, church. Y'all can do better than that. Can we put our hands together that his mercy endures forever? Thank you, Jesus.
Anybody here believe that his mercy endures forever? Anybody? Why don't you put your hands together again for Voices of Triumph. Could you turn this up a little bit, please? If we can go up a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Oakwood University, we want to thank you for hosting us. And uh, weren't you blessed by Voices of Triumph? I certainly was. Amen, amen, amen. We get to hear them all the time, and each time is better than the last time. It's just amazing. Now, you should know, VOT is not just a choir, it's a community. Come on, say amen, somebody. Isn't that what it is? It's a community. It's a village. And all young people who are thinking about coming to Oakwood, we got lots of opportunities for you to build community that will last, not just for four years, but for 40 years. Amen. Well, I want to jump right into the Word this morning, uh, because at 3.30 today at Ephesus, you'll get a chance to hear VOT again, and we want to make sure that you can get out. A sermon doesn't have to be eternal to be impactful. Come on, say amen. Can I come down here and talk to you today? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My wife and I, Dr. Prudence Pollard, is here with me, and I thank her for traveling. I'm sorry, my camp, my, my work takes me away so often. Sometimes the only times we have to really spend together is when we're on the road. And so, Dr. Prudence, would you stand, please, just so you can see Dr. Prudence Pollard. I met her at Oakwood University in 1978. Well, I met in 74, actually. We, we start dating. We graduated in 78. Um, when I met her, Dr. Zumalo, she was dating someone else. But I knew God had called me to liberate her. Come on, say amen. He called me, he called me to do that. I, I do that. I do that kind of thing. I do that. Uh, for our sister who was baptized today, may God bless you. Let's put our hands together. Thank you for your commitment. And I've never seen a baptism done like that before. Let me ask my VOTs. Had you ever seen that before? How many of you? I'd never seen that before with the cards. and the, Wasn't that wonderful? We need to do that at Oakwood, don't we? Come on, say amen. We need to do that at Oakwood. I'm going to tell Pastor Snell, we need to do that at Oakwood. We need to do that at Oakwood. So thank you so much. And sister, may God bless you as you take these steps. Um, having lived a little while. One of the reasons I try to treat everybody kindly, Sister Brown, is because even if people never say it, everybody you meet is fighting a great battle. Do you know that? They're fighting a great battle. You may not know what it is, but they're fighting a great battle, every person. Something in the past, maybe something in the present, or maybe something they fear for the future, but they're fighting a great battle. So be kind to everyone, because you never know if your word might be the word that carries them across the finish line. Just your word. Come on, say amen, somebody. Um, I want to talk to you today, quickly. I want to take the Bible and kind of you know, the students hardly ever get to hear me preach. They hear me talk and that, that kind of thing. So it's fun to be here with you today. So thank you, students. Okay, so let, here we go. Um, I want to ask you a question. I, in this sermon today that I'm going to preach to you, I've got one goal. I've got one goal in this sermon that I'm going to preach to you today. I want you to know exactly what that goal is. My goal for you today is to be able to identify a situation that you face, a challenge. And thank you, Pastor Bailey. Let me just say, okay, thank you. I never want to overlook the man of God. Thank you for the invitation. Let's put our hands together, please. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so very much for inviting us and hosting us and being so generous. Thank you. And this is a beautiful facility. Thank you for the vision behind securing such a wonderful space for worship. I got one, one, one purpose I want to do today. You got me? One thing. One thing I want you to do today. I want you, this sermon's goal has one purpose, to help you identify a situation in your life 
that needs more than an ordinary intervention, but will require the miracle working power of God for you to get victory. Can you think of a situation like that in your life? Where you might need that? You'll identify one life challenge where you need not ordinary help, but miraculous help. I said miraculous help to save the child, to save the job, to save the marriage, to save the finances. The worst day of the year for many people is April 15, tax day. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Come on, let's do that. Let's get right into it. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless us today and guide us and speak to us through this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Title of the sermon, Reservation for a Miracle. Reservation for a Miracle. It's taken from Mark chapter 10, verse 47. Here's what it says. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Reservation for a miracle. Did you know that the U.S. Department of Labor calculates that in the year 2023, for the last decade, the reservation services industry has grossed more than $56 billion. That's billion with a B. Every single day, someone somewhere in the world is making a reservation, whether it's for a hotel or for an airline flight or for a taxi or for a rental car or for an Uber as a part of this or for a Lyft. Everyone, somewhere, sometime, every moment is making a reservation. Here is the question I have for you. How many of us are making a reservation for a miracle? This man that I just read to you about, this man understands the power of making a reservation for a miracle. Now, the good news of the Bible is that the Bible is a book that's full of miracles. If I were doing a quiz this morning, because I come out of higher education, if I were doing a quiz this morning, do you know who is the first person in the Bible to ever perform a miracle? You ever thought about that? Scholars say it's Moses. It's Moses. When he walks into Pharaoh's court and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go, Moses doesn't walk in empty-handed. Remember, he has been out in the wilderness keeping sheep, and he has a staff in his hand, an old stick. And Pharaoh says to him, he says to him, he says, how do I know that God has sent you? And what does God say to Moses? He says, throw down the rod. And he does it, and it becomes a serpent. Now, that wasn't the first time it had become a serpent. As he met God at the burning bush, and God said, what is that you have in your hand? And he said, I've got an old stick. He said, throw it down. And he throws it down, and it becomes a serpent. And now God tells him to do something to show that God's miracle-working power will be with him. He says to Moses, he says, now pick it up. But what you miss is in the text it says, now take it by the tail. Now let me ask you something. Who grabs a cobra by the tail? Who grabs a rattlesnake by the tail? Who grabs any snake by the tail? But Moses reaches down and he grabs it by the tail and suddenly it becomes a rod again. Now when he steps into Pharaoh's court, God says to him, he says, take this thing and throw it down. And he, listen now, listen to the narrative, and he throws it down and it becomes a serpent. And Pharaoh says, hmm. If he was speaking today, he'd say, oh, cool. I got magicians. They can do the same thing. And the Egyptian musicians, they throw down this, their rods, and theirs look like serpents. Now, how do we know it looks like serpents? Because Satan cannot create life. But he can create illusion. And he can create deception. 
And so he throws it down. But what does Moses' serpent, Moses serpent do? He gobbles up. He swallows up all of their serpents. And now we know that God is with him. And listen to me now. Listen to me, young people. Here is what happens now. When you go to the end of the text, what was introduced as Moses' rod, now when he tells him to go to Pharaoh, the Bible says, and he took the rod of God with him. Ah. See that gift you got? It's yours until you give it to God. Then it becomes God's voice. Then it becomes God's skill. See, once you give it to God, now it becomes something else. My speaking ability, it was mine at first, but once I dedicated it, it becomes God's voice. God's ability, God's influence. That's what we teach at Oakwood University, that you are to live for something bigger than yourself. But whatever you do, you're to do it for God. And so the Bible now shows Moses as the first miracle worker, but he's certainly not the last. When you step into the New Testament, um, Jesus, if, quiz, how many miracles of Jesus are recorded in the New Testament. Don't Google it. How many? How many? 37. That's all. 37. But John says at the end of his book, Pastor, now these are the things that were written that you might believe. But if everything he ever did was written, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. And so when we look at the Bible, the Bible and the ministry of Jesus is a ministry of miracles. This man who needs a miracle knows that. He's nameless. The first thing you see when you think about him is Bartimaeus. But Bartimaeus is not a name. It's what we call a patronym. A patronym means that you're named after someone. Bar is the Hebrew word the Arab, Aramaic word, actually, for son of Timaeus. He's the son of somebody. We don't know if he's Jonah, bar Timaeus. We don't know if he's Levi, bar Timaeus. We don't know any of that. All we know is that he is the son of Timaeus. And there are scholars who say that Mark here, in Mark chapter 10, is showing us that this man who is crying out for a miracle, first of all, he's nameless. The second thing we learn about him is that he's sightless. The Bible says he's blind. You want to know something else about him? He's jobless. The Bible says he's a beggar. And begging in the first century is grinding work. Can I suggest something else? Because he's blind, he's restless. Because what we know from research on unsighted people is that their circadian rhythms are thrown into free-running cycles. So the normal light, dark calibration that gets you to feeling sleepy in the evenings, they don't have that because they are blanketed in darkness. And because they are, day may as well be night, night may as well be day. And thus, within the unsighted community, Pat, there are high levels of depression and irritability because their bodies are thrown off. Bartimaeus, sightless, nameless, jobless, restless. Let me suggest to you one more thing. He's joyless <laughs> because life in the beggar's lane is not easy. He can easily be victimized. He's blind. He's defenseless. He can't defend himself. All of that. He's joyless. But guess what? The good news of the text is that joy is on the way because your Bible says that he, look at your Bible, your Bible says that he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, this is really old school, 
This is really old school, but this is for the older people who are here. This is really old school. You remember a few years ago, Oral Roberts had a radio, a television broadcast. You remember that? You remember the T? They used to sing a song, Something Good is Going to Happen to You. Anybody remember that? Something, no, you don't, not young person, but something good. <laughs> Something good is going to happen to you. Jesus of Nazareth is passing your way. Something good was about to happen to this man. The Bible says, watch this, he heard. Listen to me now. Listen to me, young people. He could not see, but he could hear. God never gives anyone, First Lady Brown, Everything, but he gives everybody something. Nobody gets everything, but everybody gets something. And it's what you do with your something that determines your height in life, your raising in life, where you go in life. It's what you do with your something. If all you do is sit around and look at what you don't have, you will never accomplish anything in life. But once you realize that God has given me something, and whatever my something is, I need to maximize it. For Bartimaeus, he could hear. He could hear. He could not see, but he could hear. He could hear. He could hear the difference between market bartering and market bantering. He could hear. He could hear the difference between the high-pitched wheeze of a lost toddler from the giddy shrieks of children playing hide and seek. He couldn't see, but he could hear. He could hear the difference between the clink of a dime and the clang of a quarter bouncing off of his tin bowl. He could hear. He could hear the difference between the clip-clop, clip-clop of a centurion's Iberian steed and the unmetered hippity-hop of a Samaritan's lame burrow, this man could hear. Jamie Foxx said when he was trying out, when he was preparing for the movie Ray, he said he wore prosthetic eyelids because the prosthetic eyelids were the things that helped him feel what it must be like to be blind or unsighted. And what he said in 2004 was that after six hours of wearing prosthetic eyelids that simulated blindness, he could hear the buzz of little voices all around him. Bartimaeus cannot see, but he can hear the buzz. It's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And watch this now. Watch this. Jesus of Nazareth is what the crowd was saying. Jesus, Mary's son. Jesus, the illegitimate child of Joseph. It's Jesus from Nazareth who's coming. And what they thought on the Jericho Road that day was a parade of a historical, geographical figure. That's what the sighted people saw. But the unsighted beggar heard in the entourage not just the son of Joseph, but what he heard rolling down Jericho Boulevard was a mobile miracle clinic. <laughs> and as it gets within earshot, listen to me now, his powers of echolocation lock in. And he says, Jesus, Jesus, 
Son of David. You missed it, didn't you? You missed it, didn't you? Didn't you just miss it? What did he hear? Jesus of Nazareth. Pastor, I didn't see you here. Thank you. Our former conference president. I didn't see you there. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Nice to see you. And one of our professors, too, in our school of business. God be praised. Dr. and Mrs. God, God bless you. Watch this now. Watch this. What he heard is not what he said. Now, I don't have time today, but if I did, I'd talk about the difference, young people, between eyesight and insight. Now, I don't have time. I don't have time today. But, but I talk about the difference between eyesight and insight. See, because God is raising up a generation of young people who walk not by eyesight, but by insight. Eyesight says Tiger Woods had everything. Insight says Tiger had nothing. Eyesight says Jay-Z and Miss B are a power couple. Insight says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build. Eyesight says, my man better be a rocked up metrosexual having a rippling six pack who gets a medicure, a pedicure, and a, and a, and what's the other one? Manicure. I said medicure. A pad, manicure, manicure and a pedicure every day. Insight says, if he loves himself that much, he probably can't love me. Eyesight versus insight. Can I tell you what to look for in a part? Can I, can I tell you what makes great wifey material? <laughs> can I say that? Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord she shall be praised. This man has not, he doesn't have eyesight, but he has insight. He hears Jesus of Nazareth. He says, Jesus, son of David. See, he recognizes that this is not Jesus, Mary's son. This is Jesus, the Messiah. This is not just Jesus, the carpenter. This is Jesus, the creator. This is not Jesus, the son of David. This is Jesus, the son of God. And so after his echolocation locks in, he says to him, he says, Jesus, so he cries out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you were in my New Testament Greek class, I'd tell you to circle that word, cry out. That word, cry out, comes from the Greek word, Krazo. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Krazo. K R A Z O. Krazo. Crazy. <laughs> Same root. Krazo. He realizes that his miracle is on the way, and your Bible says he cries out. Because he has to make a reservation for the... Okay, okay. Let me, let me try it another way. Can I try it another way? Can I try it another way? Okay. This word is a labor and delivery word. Did you know that? Krazo is the word that was used in the first century. He cries out. It was the word to discover... It was the word to describe labor pains. Ladies... That's the that same word. It's used in Revelation chapter 12 when the woman is about to give birth, you know, with the stars and the moon and standing. That lady, an apocalyptic woman in Revelation 12, it says that she cried out to be delivered. Now watch this. This is not, this is not a cute word, everybody. This is not a cute, sophisticated word. This, this, you know, everybody who's cute and sophisticated is in the waiting room. <laughs> but the one about to deliver... She's in the stirrups. 
She's in the 10th hour of labor. She's feeling those pains that begin in the middle of the back and radiate around the abdomen. She, that, anybody know what I'm talking about? That, some of you should know what I'm talking about. And that's what, you, so, so that's what, that's what he is feeling that God is trying to give birth. Some, so he cries out in desperation. Now watch this. If you're going to get your miracle today, here's the first thing you've got to realize. Lesson one, miracles are reserved for the desperate. Miracles are reserved for the desperate. The cool need not apply. The comfortable need not apply. The contented need not apply. Because miracles are reserved for the desperate. Are you with me, everybody? That's the first key. So if you want God to interpose his miracle working power, my first question to you is how desperate are you? Is desperation your last resort while you try to work it out? Or is desperation your first move? When you fall on your knees and you say, God, I can't do this without you, and I need your miracle working power. So he's desperate. Here's the second lesson. Watch this. Here's the second lesson. As he cries out, I don't know why this happens, but it's the strangest thing in the Bible. I don't know why it happens. But when you look at the text, all you got to do is look at the text. The Bible says, and the crowd warned him to be quiet. <laughs> warned him. If it, was, if it was a Greek class, I, I'd give you the second Greek word. The second Greek word, telemazo, that word is not just a gentle urging, but that word has a threat behind it. It says, if you don't shut up, we're going to shut you up. Hello? I got a question for you quickly, quickly. Quick question, quick question. Who asked for their opinion? Who asked for their opinion? This was an A to B conversation. The Bible makes it very clear. This was Bartimaeus calling out to Jesus. Now we get a triangle at work. You better watch the people you let into your business. Who asked them? After all, Pastor, he wasn't asking for help from the needy relief fund. He wasn't trying to get some support to pay his rent. He wasn't asking the church for anything. Why do people believe they have a right to interpose themselves into things that they know nothing about? Here's what it's called. It's called proximity error. Do you know what proximity error means? Proximity error means because I live, I live close to something, I assume that I understand it. It's called proximity error. Because I'm around the pastor, I attend the church so I can run the church. Because after all, he, he makes it look easy. Am I right or wrong? He makes it look I love music. I saw what you did this morning. I, I can do that. <laughs> really? <laughs> but that's because you make it look easy. Anybody who's ever played basketball, anybody here used to play basketball? Anybody ever played? Okay, okay, if you ever played basketball, what LeBron does, what LeBron does looks easy. Until you get out there and you try to dunk and you realize that 10 feet is way off the ground because that's how high the goal is. Because they make it look easy. So guess what? They decide that they can coach him on how to get his miracle. But your Bible says, more, you, better, you better watch who you take your counsel from. <laughs> I, said, I don't know. This church is probably different from every other church I've been in. But, but let, me, let, me just, let me just say something to you. I, I bet you. I bet you half the problems of this church could be solved 
by one half of the people just minding their own business. Can anybody say amen? amen? Here's what I don't understand. How someone gets baptized and they become just a wonderful little Bible study, go to Sabbath school people. And, oh, and then, but, but you give them, you give them about, about five years under the Pharisees. And, and, and they become, and they become card carrying members of the SDAPD with all of its different divisions, like, like the potluck division. They, they want to make sure everything is vegan. Or the wardrobe division. They specialize in monitoring skirt lengths. Come on, say amen, somebody. or the praise and worship division of the SDAPD. <laughs> They're going to make sure it don't get too emotional because <laughs> that's their specialty. Watch this, though. The Bible says the more they tried to hush him, the louder he got. <laughs> Bartimaeus is my kind of worshiper. The, the more they tried to shut him down, the louder he got. Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's the second lesson. If you want to get your miracle, first you know that miracles are reserved for the desperate. Here's what you better know from the story of Bartimaeus, that miracles are reserved for the defiant. You can let them shut you down if you want to. They're going to shut you right out of your miracle. Uh-huh. She, she been married eight times. How's she going to tell you how to take care of your husband? Why are you listening to her? Why are you listening to her? She done failed seven times. Why are you listening to her? What does she know? Physician, heal thyself. They're reserved for the defiant. Look at those three boys thrown into the fire. The king says to them, he says, look, he says, he says, I know this is not true. I gave you, I gave you gentlemen full, full ride scholarships to the University of Babylon. <laughs> I gave you everything you ever wanted. You had the finest of food. You, I can't believe that I ask you to do just this one thing, just this one. I'm not even asking you to do it all the time. Just when you hear the music, Daniel chapter 3, all I want you to do is bow. Okay, so if you can't bow, then look like you're tying your shoe. Do, do something. And what do the boys say? They're defiant. They say, oh, no. They say, no, 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 no. They say, they say, King, our God is able to deliver us. But if not... We will not bow down. Esther. I love the story of Esther. I love Esther. Because Esther is a great tale on never forgetting where you came from. If you wear this in any shade, black or brown, don't ever forget where you came from. Because Mordecai said to him, he said, now, she said, well, I haven't even been in, I haven't seen the king in 30 days. How in the world am I going to? He looked at her like, what? What? You're not, what? But let me tell you something. You're sitting up there in royalty now, but you know whatever they do to us, 
they're going to do to you. When they come for us, they're going to come for you. And, 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 and Esther says, you know something? She says, you know something? I'm going to go into the king. And if I perish, I perish. I love Esther. I perish. Miracles are reserved for the defiant. The woman who's blocked by the crowd, she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, they're going to step on my hands, they're going to step on my forearms, they're going to step on my elbow, they're going to step on my shoulder, but you know something? I'm going to push through until I get to the hem of his garment. If you are not defiant, you will never get your miracle. And stop listening to your little friends who don't know nothing. Y'all have never heard no PhD talk like this. Have you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's the last point. Watch this now. Here we go. I'm wrapping it up. Here we go. So now, Jesus is walking. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And your Bible says, you got to read the story, Jesus stood still. And I can hear him saying to his disciples, somebody called me. And they say, like, you know, disciples were from California. So they say, dude, <laughs> dude, everybody's calling you, dude. Everybody's calling you. And he said, no, 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 no. Somebody called me by name. He stops. He says, somebody called me. He says, it's just that, that one over there, you meet him? That nameless, restless, joyless, disruptive him? Jesus says, go get him. Now watch this. Watch this. Young people, listen to this lesson. Watch this. They run over to him, and they say, cheer up. <laughs> cheer up. Cheer up. Wait, wait a minute. 30 seconds ago, they were saying, shut up. Ch cheer up. That's why you can't follow the crowd. Because the crowd is fickle. The crowd will change. The crowd loses its orientation. That's why you dismiss the crowd. And Jesus says, Jesus says, come over. And he comes over, and now he's standing in the presence of Jesus. And now Jesus says, listen to me, he's talking to him, but 2,000 years into the future, he's talking to you. He says, now what do you want me to do for you? What would you like me to do? The question asked then is the question he's asking now. What would you like me to do for you? Is there any way that my mother and father can get back together, Lord, and reunite our family? What would you like me to do for you? Is there any way that you can fix my finances once and for all? What would you like me to do for you? Is there any way, Lord, that you could lead me into another job? I'm only keeping this one because I have to pay the bills. What would you like me to do for you? He looks Bartimaeus in those blinded eyes, and he says, now what would you like me to do for you? And what does Bartimaeus say? Without hesitation, he says, I want to see again. You got it? I want to see 
That's the third Greek word. I'm sorry, everybody. That's the third Greek word. It's not I want to see. It's I want to see. It's anablepo. It's a compound word. It says, I want to see again. Apparently, at one point in his life, Bartimaeus could see. We don't know how he lost his vision. We don't know if it was diabetic retinopathy science majors. We don't know if it was macular degeneration. We don't know. We don't know if it was a blow to the head that disconnected the right. We don't know. We don't know, but there was a time when he could see, and there was a time when you could see. When you joined the church, you wanted to help God finish the work. But the longer you stayed, you became a pew member. Get busy and get active again. Take up a ministry. Do so, who I don't know who did that work in Walmart, Pastor. But again, some, you never know what your ministry is going to yield. And so he says, I want to see again. And then your Bible says, Jesus said, according to your faith, you're desperate defiant, and watch this now, your decisive faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. And your Bible says, eventually, he received his sight. Isn't that what it said? Yeah. Huh? Come on now, somebody said yes. Come on, let's read it. Isn't that what it said? Come on, look at verse 52. It says, eventually... He received his, isn't that what it says? It says eventually, didn't it? Doesn't the Bible say gradually he received his sight? Isn't that what it says? It didn't say that? It didn't say eventually. It didn't say gradually. Oh, okay, here's what it said. It said ultimately. No, 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 no. The operative word. Immediately. Immediately. Watch this now. God can fix in an instant. The thing you've been wrestling with for a decade. Immediately, he received his sight. And your Bible says, and he followed Jesus on the way. The question he asked 2,000 years ago, he's asking you right now. What would you like me to do for you? Do you know what it is? If you do, get up and come down to the front. If you know what it is, you don't have to tell me. Tell him. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And we're going to claim his promise. We're going to claim it. We're going to claim it. Is it healing in your body? Is it a financial blessing? Is it a ruptured relationship that you want healed? Is it something that you're sorry about and you want them to accept your apology? Is it forgiveness? Every time I think about him, you say to yourself, I get angry. He left me with these little children. Is it forgiveness? Is it success in your work? He's saying to you today, what do you like me to do for you? Are you desperate, defiant, and decisive? Now, we're going to claim his blessings, and we're going to leave this sanctuary knowing that immediately our reservation for a miracle has been made. And we're going to trust God to work it out. And we're going to leave here with a lighter head and a lighter heart. We're going to put our burdens down and say, it's all right now. It's all right. It's all right. 
and Father, we thank you that you are the great miracle worker. And these are your people who have come to you in desperate, defiant, and decisive faith. <clears throat> and we know that you will not disappoint. So we leave this place having made our reservation for a miracle. And now we know that you will fulfill your every promise because every promise of God is yea and amen. And every victory of God has been delivered. And so we thank you and we praise you and we love you for the work that you are already doing in this very moment. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen and amen. God bless you, and would you please go back to your seats, please. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Let's give Dr. Pollard a hand clap of praise in this place. What a powerful, powerful message today. What a powerful message. We are getting ready to just give you some housekeeping tips. Again, we want to thank so many of you for coming. If this is your first time worshiping with us, would you just raise your hand, please? Your very first time worshiping with us. We just want to put a gift in your hand. I have a hand over here. Just, just raise it up high. Raise it up high. We want to put a gift in your hand to thank you so much for coming. We recognize there are many places you could have gone today, but because you're here, that just makes our worship experience that much better. So we thank you. Just keep your hand raised so we can put that gift in your hand to thank you so much for coming. If you're looking for a church home, look no further because there's a whole lot of churches bigger, but ain't none than Central Worship Center. We thank you so much for coming, Dr. Pollitt, and also, also the Voices of Triumph. We're going to be there at 3.30, so we're getting ready to wrap up. Voices of Triumph, we have a gift for you as well. On your way out, we want to put something in your hand. So make sure you see our hospitality committee. We work hard for this because we knew you were coming. And we just want to thank you so much for coming to Central. We have uh, last week, last week, last week, I asked you to write down the names for our evangelistic meeting. And you did an outstanding job. What I failed to ask you was to make sure you put your name on there. We've called several of them, and we're finding out we need to have your name for our introduction. So the, the ushers, have you put this in their hands? Put, please, if you're a member, you wrote those names down. We're just asking you to duplicate them again and bring them back on this Sabbath, next Sabbath coming, or drop them off, put them back in the hands of the usher. I just need your name on there and along with your list. If you forgot them, we'll have a master list on next week next week. We thank you so much for worshiping with us today and we have a few announcements. Just a few announcements. We want to give you an update on what's happening here at Central. Many of you have been asking, okay, what's next? What are we doing here? So, for the first, for those of you that have been here the first time, we've been here since January. We are a church and a work in progress. But the good news is we have finished a small bathroom, which is right outside the youth chapel. And we want to just remind you, if you're able-bodied, go down to the lower level and reserve that bathroom for those that really need it on this level and then the ones that can go right outside the chapel. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of the wiring that we were tripping over when we first got to the church, it's now all in the walls and disappeared. And thanks to the media team, uh, so all of that, Anything dealing with streaming, it's all tucked away. Uh, there's a lot of light bulbs in here. We changed them all out and they're not LED, so we're trying to save some money. Uh, we're doing, we have finished the basement, the waterproofing, so that's been completed. And so when you think about it, when we moved in here, there were two or three goals we had. We wanted to dry out the building and we wanted to make sure that it was safe and secure for you. And so the basement work has been done. And so now we can get to some of the more cosmetic kinds of things like flooring, painting, and lighting. 
but those are to come. I uh, also want to just let you know that we are working on our list from the fire marshal. Anytime you move into a building, the city comes out and they look and they give you a list of things that they want changed to correct it. And so thanks to our leaders and officers of the church, the media team, the ushers, the deacons, everybody's trying to take a piece of this so that we can get all those things accomplished. We have completed or put in new windows uh, in this front uh, lobby side on the ramp side and all the trim work has been done around that. Um, we've put the new uh, tile in the floor in there and we're getting a new roof. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And praise the Lord for insurance coverage. So praise the Lord for that. So that is, that is something that when you think of the blessings and how God continues to bless this, con this congregation, and it's through your generous giving. And, you know, for our online folks, and I don't know if we've been cut off just yet, but we have people that have never even set foot in this sanctuary who are faithful in their giving. All of you have been faithful in your giving. Uh, we are going to begin the painting on the administrative side of the church. And this tip is for everybody. Every Sunday, we have cleanup. When we moved into this building, we brought a lot of our stuff with us. And some of that stuff we no longer need. Some of that stuff is not in good repair. So if you are a ministry leader in your designated area, in your closets, in wherever you have your stuff, it's purge time. Because when we get down in the lower level to begin to lay flooring and stuff like that, we can't be tripping over a lot of stuff. And we don't want to have to move stuff time and time again. So if it's yours, claim it. If we're going to keep it and use it, keep it. But if something, it's kind of like your closet at home. If you know you haven't worn something in a couple years, and you keep saying to yourself, wait till I lose that 10 pounds. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. It's time to get rid of it. So the same thing here at the church. So every Sunday. We're getting ready to replace four exterior doors. We continue to work on the electrical work throughout the church. Uh, uh, in the youth area, we're going to get new lighting in there and also in the lower level. And uh, we are also have just recently voted to go ahead and approve the security cameras for the building and the parking lot. And folks, we have not forgotten about the lift or the elevators uh, for this church. And we are still getting the estimates and looking and there's things that we have to do. But we want to make sure that you, in your giving, you are kept up to date. We thank you because it is through your generosity that we are able to do all that we can do. And to God be the glory for great things he has done. And then lastly, it's the little things. Like, praise the Lord for lawn care. You know, it rained an awful lot this week. And it was looking pretty rough out there. But Pastor, I don't know, he got somebody. So thank God for that. So if there's anything that I've forgotten or overlooked, we will catch you up next week and next time. Uh, at this time, I would like for uh, Sister Valerie Jones to join me up here. And as you're leaving today, let's extend the right hand of fellowship to her. So Valerie, would you come on up? And show her the central love. Consider yourselves dismissed. Consider yourselves dismissed and come on and up and give her the right hand of fellowship.